Hey guys, thanks so much for joining me here. We're going to be talking about color, um, kind of encapsulating all of its qualities, seeing some great examples of how color has been used in art and some of the visual phenomenon surrounding color. Um, but we're going to even start with some basics, or what seem like basics, um, like uh, what is color in and of itself and how do we perceive it. And uh, I think oftentimes with color we feel like it's we feel like it's obvious, we feel like it's basic because we've known since we were two or three what the names of the different colors were. Um, but color is something that is actually much more complex than we often give it credit for. And as artists and designers, we want to really understand it, um, all of its powers, all of its capabilities, and its subtleties, and be able to kind of harness those in our works of art and design. So here we go. Um, the question of what is color and how we perceive it was something that was very much on the mind of a 17th century scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, who you've probably heard of. And a very simple experiment that he did that ended up having profound impact was um, simply letting sunlight flow through a prism. And when he did this, he, he probably was just anticipating that it would come out the other side, but instead, when the light passed through that prism, it came out in these separated colors of light, the different hues that we see. And then he was able to take that spectrum of light, spectrum of color, and actually pass it back through the prism again here in this little lower diagram, and it reunited all the spectrum into white light again. And so we suddenly had this idea that white light is actually the encapsulation, the inclusion of this whole wide spectrum of color. Now, we understand now, after several hundred years of, of various studies and various scientists and artists working on this um, concept, we think of light now um, as uh, wavelengths, as part of the electromagnetic radiation that is visible to our eyes. We know that some other animals can see different colors and see more colors than we can. Um, humans, we can see in this uh, what seems like a narrow range, um, although when we consider all the different hues that are included in that range. It's impressive. Um, but we can see between UV rays and infrared rays of light, we see this spectrum of color. Early uh, ideas by Newton and Goethe and others, um, they were trying to understand, kind of create a model for how we could understand color relationships. And we now think of that spectrum as being linear. However, we also realize that, if I just step back here, that there's something related between the, the opposite ends of the continuum. These reds and these red violets over here seem very um, continuous, contiguous. And so we've actually come to envision the color um, organization as a wheel rather than as a linear spectrum. So even going back to the 17th century, we have Newton and Goethe giving us these kinds of sketches, these kinds of theories about how the color relates. Now we also understand a little bit about how the human eye perceives color, and it's not as simple as we often think. We're, we are very likely to describe, say, our car as being blue, right? Our car owns the color blue in a sense, or your favorite shirt might be red. We think of red being a property, something that's owned by that, that object. But in reality, color is a function uh, of light waves hitting an object and either being reflected away from it or absorbed into it, right? So when we see the color yellow on an object, if you say, like, my shirt is yellow, it's because the light waves are hitting the surface of it, they're absorbing the blue rays, the red and green are coming back and combining in our eye to, to give us a perception of yellow. Same with the blue over here, that the red is absorbed and the blue and green are, are um, adding together in our eye to give us that sense of kind of the teal quality of this form. With black, when we perceive the color black, it's because all of the light waves are being absorbed into the darkness. Or with an object that we would call white, it's because all of the uh, light waves are being reflected away and then therefore recombining in our eye and communicating the sense of lightness or whiteness. Now, if you're stumped a little bit here in these diagrams because the light waves are depicted as red, green, and blue, um, or, which is the primary set when we're talking about light, that's because maybe you're more familiar with what we call the primary set when we're talking about subtractive color theory or when we're working with paint. And in that case, we think of the primaries being red, yellow, and blue, right, rather than green. 
Um, this is a good example. So color in light versus color in pigment are actually two different systems of color. Now again, when we're talking about color in light, like imagine using, um, if you've seen spotlights in the theater, and using spotlights of various colors. If you actually recombine all of the colors together, you're going to add up those spotlights, and they'll actually combine to a white. And so we call color in light, we call that additive color. Additive, right? Um, however, when we're looking at paint, and some of you guys might remember this from childhood or maybe more recently, that if you actually combine the different colors of paint together, you end up with darkness, maybe kind of a muddy grayish brown, kind of black. And so we call color in pigment subtractive color. Most of our 2D color class is engaged with subtractive color. Right? So be sure that you're clear on the difference between additive color and subtractive color, and that each has a different primary set. Um, again, we often think of the primaries, along, you know, along with sort of underestimating the complexity of color. We also uh, think that it seems very clear how color works, how it functions together. But actually, there are still many unanswered questions about how color relates, how colors relate to one another. Um, there are other points of view as well. So we're very used to the 12 hue system that we will adopt and use in our class. Um, however, I just want you to know, have on your radar, that there actually are other theories about how color works. So for instance, Albert Munsell, a very popular um, both artist and colorist, putting forth a lot of very interesting and influential ideas about how color works, um, had this system. He believed in a five uh, point primary system. So along with the red, yellow, and blue that we are familiar with, he also had green and violet as primaries. And then from those would mix his set of secondaries. Now this is the color wheel that we will be using most often, which is that 12 hue color wheel. We've got our three primaries, red, yellow, and blue, our three secondaries that are a function of the primary. So we've got green, violet, and orange. And then our tertiaries that are all nicely marked here with the number three. We have six tertiaries. And the name of the primary always comes first. So orange and yellow mixed together to give us a yellow-orange or blue and violet mixing together to give us blue-violet. So the name of the primary comes uh, first, and the secondary second. Um, if you haven't yet, add, this, add a diagram of this color wheel into your sketchbook and be really familiar with its organization. Um, we're going to point out a couple of uh, color relationships here as well. And make sure these are in your notes or somehow documented on your color wheel. Um, we've, we've diagnosed our primary colors. Um, with those primaries, in theory at least, you can mix any other color, but you, there's no way to mix those primaries, right? There's no two colors that add up to yellow, to blue, or to red. Our secondaries and tertiaries we're familiar with now. Our complementary colors. So complementary is the idea of colors on opposite sides of the wheels. For instance, red and green would be a complementary set. Orange and blue would also be complementary, and yellow and violet. Now what's interesting about these is that since we know that in light, at least, when you take all of the colors of the color wheel and add them together, they recombine to white light, or to this kind of wholeness, then, then we can think in theory again that adding colors from the opposite side of the wheel, in a sense they kind of complete each other. They kind of add up to a wholeness. So there's something that's very harmonious in their relationship. But because they're on opposite sides of the wheel, opposite sides of the spectral range, they also kind of have this um, combustion to them, this kind of fieriness. I, I sometimes say they have sort of a love-hate relationship because oftentimes you'll have a cool, like a violet, um, and the yellow is going to feel more warm. Same with red and green. The green reads as more cool, and the red is a warm color, um, and obviously with the blue and orange. And so they kind of have these um, opposites that are attracting kind of feel to them. So if you see an image with a complementary color, sch color scheme, it often has this real immediate appeal. It gr draws your eyes in, but it also has a lot of energy to it. A split complementary scheme is taking any hue, and rather than its direct complement, the two hues on either side of it. So the yellow with a red-violet and a blue-violet. 
right? Or a red with a yellow green and a blue green. That would be split complementary. And it still has some of that same kind of power packed quality of the complementary, but just slightly toned down. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, we also want to talk about analogous color schemes. An analogous color scheme is any three to four, occasionally five hues that are next to each other on the color wheel. So if we saw a graphic work with um, yellow greens, greens, and blue greens, just in this three hue color range, that would be analogous. Or it could be maybe reds all the way to yellows. These would all, um, if these were all in one composition, this would be an analogous color scheme. With analogous colors, since the colors are right next to each other on the color wheel, they tend to feel very related, sort of they, they feel like a family of colors, so they tend to be a little more gentle on your eye, um, very sort of easygoing, um, harmonious. Another term to be familiar with is monochromatic. Mono meaning one and chroma meaning color. So a monochromatic color scheme is a color scheme that uses only one hue but a variety of values and or saturations. So if in a painting you can only see that artists only use the color red, but light and dark reds are more saturated or intense and then desaturated reds, um, that would be monochromatic. And then lastly, I mentioned earlier, the warm cool. So for, um, for the most part, we tend to see, if your color scheme is, uh, color wheels and organized this way with the yellow on top, we tend to see these colors on the left side as overall warm and we tend to have relationship to thinking about like yellow as sunlight and red as fire so these tend to feel warm and the right side tends to feel more cool with the blues and greens reminding us of water ice snow those kinds of things now I will say color is very relative so depending on its circumstance, what other colors are around it, um, sometimes you can have reds that seem very cool, or occasionally you'll find a blue that feels very uh, intense, very fiery. And certainly these colors that are kind of on the boundaries, um, violets and red violets, can often be thrown either direction toward the cool or the warm, just depending on what's around it. And the same with the greens and yellow greens. Um, so we'll see in our ongoing in investigations that color is it is just so influenced by its surroundings. Um, let's see if you can name these color schemes. So take a second. What color scheme does this appear to be? And hopefully you said monochromatic, right? It's all within one hue. It's all the hue of blue, but light and dark values of the blue. Try this one. We've got dominant kind of a, a red, blue, and yellow even kind of a yellow-orange. But dominantly, I would say that's a primary scheme. Another word for that would be a triadic. Triadic would be any three hues that are equidistant on the color wheel. Triadic. So this would be a triadic or a primary color scheme. This is a work by Jasper Johns. Um, here, what do you recognize in both of these works? Hopefully you noticed a complementary scheme, right? That orange and blue representing opposite sides of the color wheel, that kind of hot and cold relationship that is both uh, uh, kind of alluring and also has a little bit of that kind of fiery relationship there. Here with Claude Monet's Water Lilies. Dominantly, it's an analogous scheme. Now, there are a few reds thrown in there, a few yellows, but overall, we're, we're really taken in by the greens, blue-greens, blues, and blue-violets. So dominantly, an analogous color scheme. And you can see how it's very restful for your eye, very peaceful. Here again, do you recognize a complementary scheme with the orange and blue? And here, just one image to remind us that, of course, in fashion, this is very much a part of it. We've got an analogous scheme here, right? We've got the yellows to yellow oranges, oranges and reds. So a beautiful kind of fiery, warm, we could also say a warm color scheme. Good, so hopefully those were pretty easy for you to recognize those different schemes. Now, color also has so many fantastic and surprising and fun capabilities. Um, one phenomenon is called simultaneous contrast. And this is the tendency of a color to induce its opposite, so its complement, in hue, value, and intensity upon an adjacent color and to be mutually affected in return. Now in this example here, we've kind of, uh, kind of controlled 
the possibilities. So just if you stare at the left hand side at that black dot in the center and really let those yellow dots, those nine yellow dots, fill your viewpoint. And just wait for a few seconds. And then when you move your eyes, shift your eyes to the right to focus on the other black dot, you should see the opposite of the first composition. So where the yellow circles were, were now you see the complementary sort of violet circles. And where the white was in between, you're now seeing some of the yellow. <coughs> and that's partly because this yellow is always calling us to see its opposite. It's, it's wanting us to see the violet that's on the other side of the spectrum. And so we, we, our eye imposes that violet color into these white sections. And then when we switch over to this open white space, those light violets have become yellow, and the yellow here again is calling out to the violet, which is phenomenal. So when you think about designing a painting or a graphic composition, a, an advertisement or a CD cover, um, the colors that you choose are also going to um, sort of provoke in the viewer's eyes their opposites, right? Really fun and interesting dynamic. It, it reminds us that color is not this stable property again, but it is this continual relationship that is always changing between the light source, the object, and our eyes. So it's a very lively relationship. <laughs> a second one and a related concept after image. After image is a visual sensation that occurs after the original visual, visual stimulation has ended and kind of what is left over the haze that kind of hangs in your eyes. So here again, let yourself stare at that white dot in the center for a few moments. Just taking in those stripes and stars. And of course that seems familiar, but in the wrong color scheme, right? But what happens next when you stare at the white screen, hopefully You've got red and white stripes with the blue uh, square with white stars, right? So you see how that orange in the left, up left corner provokes the blue. The black is provoking a white, and this kind of teal is provoking the red, right? And again, remember, we're looking at the primaries in light since we're on a computer rather than the primaries in pigment. Okay, let's talk about a few other characteristics of color. So we've talked about hue. Let's remind ourselves about value. And value, as opposed to hue being sort of the family name of a color, value is the quality of light or dark in a color. And even when we're just working with a gray scale um, or a, a value scale, like on the left, it still has so much potential, potential um, in and of itself, even before we add additional hues to it. So you guys are familiar now with the value scale. We tend to uh, kind of, the tradition is to draw a color scale with kind of one to 10 of values, the one being the lightest, 10 being the darkest. We also would tend to describe this end uh, of the value scale as high value, the lighter one. So like one to three would be high value, maybe seven to 10 would be in the low value range. Um, almost as if you're picturing like having a dimmer switch for a light switch, you know, and as you lower it, the lights go down, right? So it's low value. I love this simple diagram here that reminds us that even just with value, just the way that you place your highlights, midtones, and darks, that you can create the illusion of space, um, which is part of the magic of art, really, is to create something that seems dimensional on a, on a flat two-dimensional plane. Looking at black and white photography for some inspiration when it comes to value, um, we can see both of these images and how the black and white value range can um, be so communicative and so beautiful. On the left, with Robert Maplethorpe's um, portrait of Melody here, we have this really high contrast relationship of value, right? High contrast because there's really dark darks, really bright lights, and very little of kind of the medium range. Um, there's not very many kind of threes to sevens on that value range, but a lot of sort of the ones and twos and the sevens and, or the kind of eights and nines and tens. When we look at Edward Weston's image on the right of a pepper from 1930, I love how he has really transformed this very common, very banal object, something so ordinary that we would never really think of it as an object of beauty. Um, and just by photographing it in this way with the light playing across its curves, it really becomes this sensuous, almost uh, kind of sexy object just because of the way it's formed, right? Um, it's really transformative, just the way that we can depict an object, the sense of light and contour that we give to it. 
So these are great examples of value and how, how it can work. But of course, we're also interested in how value works in color. And in this, um, this color wheel that's actually 24 colors, it's kind of beautiful to see the pure colors on the outside, but then the value range on the center. And I think it's worth noting always that we're very comfortable with seeing kind of uh, reds to light pinks, we would call them, right? Blues and light blues. But over here with the yellows and oranges, it's very stri striking and surprising when we get into the dark values of oranges and yellows, even kind of the yellow greens, that these actually start to relate more to what we might call browns. And we usually stop thinking of these as being on a color range, on a hue, uh, in a hue, and just kind of think of them as uh, neutrals. But they actually are still related to the family of oranges or the family of yellows in many cases. Um, we looked at our value range in black and white, but of course we can do a value range in color. Um, and we have done some of these. And I wanted to introduce just a few more terms here. The word tint. So if you're dealing with tints of a color, that means you have taken the pure t tone, say this blue, and you've added white to get tints. So tints are adding white to a pure hue. Shades are adding black <coughs> to a pure hue. And then tones, tones are when you add grays, desaturated notes to a pure hue. It's also worth noting here that pure hues have different value ranges. So a yellow straight out of the tube is going to be, uh, generally it's going to be significantly lighter in value than say a red purely out of the tube or a blue or a violet would tend to be the darkest. Now, coming back to Munsell, we introduced earlier that Munsell had this idea that there would be five primary colors. That part of his color scheme didn't kind of, uh, wasn't adopted by the mainstream exactly. But another aspect of his color system has been really influential, and that is that he saw color as a, in a kind of a three-dimensional model. So he thought of color like this, that the value range was sort of this uh, vertical axis, hue, happened on a horizontal axis, kind of going around different families. And then chroma went from the center of the circle outward, right? So also sort of on a horizontal, but not radiating out. And so it looks like this, value, lights to darks, hues going around to each of the different hues, and then saturation, which is our third term that we're practicing here, third quality of color, goes from gray in the center out toward the pure hue. So you saw the pure hue out here. As you add gray, you go more toward the center. Right? And with all of the colors, it might have looked something like this. This really kind of beautiful three-dimensional model of how color functions with all of its three characteristics. So the characteristics of color in total are the hue, value, and here, saturation added in. It's also interesting to see the opposites. So I guess, again, those complementary relationships, the reds over here, being opposed to the greens, the blues kind of co coming toward the front here, uh, opposite of the oranges. And that as you add the complements going toward gray, uh, or add the complements together, sorry, you end up moving toward gray. We're going to do some studies of that pretty soon, of how the complements relate to desaturating or how they function to desaturate each other when you add them together. This is an example using um, uh, additive uh, color theory or light color theory. So uh, red and its um, complement in light would be sort of a cyan. Um, adding those together and they progressively desaturate each other, right? The blue is getting warmer as it goes toward the red. The reds are getting cooler. And they meet with sort of this, what we call an achromatic gray in the center, right? Achromatic. In here again, kind of seeing the, the relationship across. Now again, there are limits to our color theory. So the theory that complements add to gray is not always matched, and that just depends on your individual brands of paint, the type of pigment, and the exact type of, of paint that you're using. Um, in theory, blue and orange would add to a gray. What we're gonna see when we try this in a week or two is that it'll make more of sort of a, a brownish, sort of a warm gray, but very useful ideas. Um, we're going to end up here with just a few images of color, just talking about how color can be used, um, what its function is. And I think it's really important for us as visual artists to really think not only about, I think often as viewers of art, we look at the image and we just sort of take in the whole thing. 
um, without really asking questions about how has the artist accomplished this with color. But now, as we're becoming sort of experts in color, working toward our understanding of art and design, we want to stop and ask, well, how did they use color in this way, and how could I use those same principles in my own work? Uh, there's a, another phenomenon that many artists have put to use, which is the idea of optical mixing. So here, George Seurat, in this very famous painting, in a very large painting, um, has used what was called, the technique was called pointillism, meaning that he built this huge image just of small dots. On the right hand, you have a detail of this center figure here. So here she is enlarged for us. And he actually didn't draw any lines or shapes or fill in whole shapes with flat color, but every form is just built up of these tiny, tiny dots all over this huge composition. And what he was relying on was that when he put down, um, you know, yellow and blue dots or blue and white dots or, or in the tree trunk, um, yellows and reds and blues all together, that from a distance, all of those colors are going to mingle in your eye and add up to the correct color. So, you know, he could use yellows and blues in the grass because in your eye they're going to add up to a green, right? So that's the idea of optical mixing. A more recent artist who also uses that technique is uh, Chuck Close. And this is uh, his painting on the right with a detail on the left. Um, Chuck Close usually divides his canvases into this kind of grid um, that we're familiar with now. But inside of his grids, he'll actually create these small kind of circular um, compositions. They're almost like, it's almost like there's a million abstract compositions that go into making this one representational image. So from a distance, you see his images, and they feel almost photorealistic. They feel very detailed. But as you get closer and closer to them, you realize that there are these tiny squares filled with colors of pure color. So a, a pure blue and a red that add up to sort of a violet in your eye. Some other ways that we would describe color, um, we would want to discriminate and, and describe when we see an artist who's using objective color, or you might say observed color, meaning that they are looking at nature and trying to actually objectively um, or kind of authentically um, reproduce their experience. Now in these two images, there's quite a different sensation of color with Claude Monet on the right, an impressionist painter, and Thomas Anschutz, more of a realist painter on the left. And yet both of these artists were actually trying to reproduce nature as they saw it, not interpreting it through their emotions or symbolic color or anything, but just really trying to capture what they saw. <coughs> The opposite of observed or objective color would be expressive or subjective color. And this is where an, an artist is intentionally, knowingly taking liberties with the color, interpreting it via you know, emotional um, ideas, con other conceptual possibilities. Um, but they're willfully kind of putting pinks and blues or, or reds where they are not typically seen in the real world. Right? So that would be subjective or expressive. And then, of course, symbolic color. So in this case, when Andy Warhol puts this gold background behind this image of Marilyn Monroe in the year before she died, um, or the year after she died, sorry, um, he's definitely thinking about her as this iconic symbol, um, that she was famous and wealthy and elevated, which is, you know, gold is, kind of, uh, of course, associated with status, right, and rarity and special qualities. Um, and then, of course, in the, we could go back further in Western tradition, as Warhol was certainly aware, um, that gold has also been thought of as like a divine color. And so, in a sense, he's giving us a, a new saint here with Marilyn and kind of maybe even saying that um, celebrity has replaced religion, has replaced the, the need for saints and martyrs of, of the medieval and Renaissance age. And he's given, this, this, given us this new saint, this new icon of, of his own era. Right? So color can also be used objectively, subjectively, or, and or symbolically. Color also has the power to communicate textures or transparency. Um, this rather, uh, I think we can say creepy, uh, painting by James Rosenquist is incredible in its photorealism. Um, it's really believable and, and it does also kind of give you uh, this strange sensation of staring at the face of this doll, but her face is covered with plastic. And of course, there's no plastic here, right? He's just found uh, trans translucent layers of paint and blues 
and whites and off-whites and violets to give us this sense that there is something between us and the doll and that that something is this kind of um, cellophane that's reflective of the light around it, right? So interesting how to do that with just color, right? The idea of transparency, a more uh, non-representational image here, but you can still see the beauty of, say, this colored circle, that as it intersects with this other colored circle underneath it, it changes tone from a more pure yellow to a more desaturated yellow. Or here again, this circle overlapping in three parts, so it color, its color changes at each part. Right? So a sense that we're being able to see through one shape to the shapes beneath it, and that the color is, is thus affected or uh, texture and reflectivity, right? So looking at things like uh, the surface of the water here in this painting by Peter Doig, how beautiful it is, the way that the kind of um, uh, glint and uh, uh, off the surface of the water is creating these arcs and circles around the feet of this boy, right? And apparently Peter Doig, the, the artist here, was having um, his brother stand on this iced pond but had actually sprayed some fresh water on it so that he could both be secure standing on the ice but also have a little bit of movement in the water to create these ripples, right? Beautiful sense of reflectivity. Um, we can also look to, even in non-representational images and very uh, minimalist kind of composition, here that, that color just has an emotional power, maybe some would, some would even say a spiritual power, um, that artists like Olitsky in this case were very interested in, and next we'll look at a painting by Mark Rothko. And these artists are very aware of the subtle colors, of, uh, subtle, subtle power of color. Um, these paintings tended to be huge, kind of mural size, large wall size images. And even though there's not imagery here for you to grab onto, our eye is meant to wander from, from side to side, and as it does, it progresses from this really cool, more deep blue-violet, let's say, and maybe we kind of find ourselves moving through this more red-violet, kind of pinkish tones underneath. And he's building these colors through a lot of many, many transparent layers over and over again, so it's not just one application of paint, but many. And of course, remembering that idea of after image and simultaneous contrast, we know that as we're staring at these purples, our eyes are also wanting to um, see the other side of the color spectrum. So we're also wanting to see yellows. And so our eye is superimposing those yellows at warmth across these purples, right? So it's no surprise that when we get over here, we're seeing much more warm tones. And those warm tones, again, will change our eyes as we move back into the purples. So it's not at all a flat experience, looking at even a simple image like this that deals with color. Our eyes move, in this case, from these oranges that provoke a blue in our eyes. And after we stare at the oranges for a while, we move to the white, but the white is going to seem more bluish, right? More cool because of its warm counterpart. Or we could stare at the pinks for a while and probably have a greenish tone kind of provoked in our eyes. So being able to sort of meander through these works and experience those changes of color and the interactions of color is very um, provocative and moving. And people like Rothko in this case really felt like he was painting about the mystical, the sublime, uh, a sort of spirituality, although not of a specific religion. Um, but it, it, it makes sense to think about a f an infinite God and how difficult it is to define God in finite objects or images. So kind of having this uh, more open-ended approach to dealing with spirituality. Um, Hans Hoffman here is not as, as thoughtful on spirituality per se, um, but really interested in the, the action of color. And so you can see, again, in the simple, um, simple in the sense it's non-representational forms, and we recognize them as squares and rectangles, and yet that warm yellow and that warm red really pop forward and then that, those blues and greens recede. So we've got a great sense of space just because of that contrast of color, right? So color can definitely be used to create a sense of space as well as mood or emotion. In this representational image, we've got what we would call atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective um, relates to the phenomenon that colors in the distant appear more foggy, um, less saturated, and less detailed whereas images and objects in the foreground tend to seem more clear, more um, defined, and more saturated in color. 
So that's atmospheric perspective. So imagine if you were painting a landscape, how you would alter the colors as you go further back into the distance to make it seem, to give us a sense of that space. And then some artists actually want to intentionally collapse space, and they can use color to do that as well. So in this case, Henry Matisse in the early 1900s was at the beginning of, of modern art, really um, moving away from representation. And so he wanted to collapse the space here. He gives us some spatial cues, like a slight bit of linear perspective across the angle of this table, a little bit of overlap with the maid feeling like she's behind the edge of the table. And yet by using this red and blue all over the wall, the back wall and the foreground table, he um, just uh, completely collapses the space and makes gives us these kind of um, strange spatial sensation, right? He's intentionally playing with the space here by using the color in this way. Lastly, this would be example, we, we mentioned the word earlier of tone. And this is an example of what might be called a tonal painting, an American painter named George Innes, using such subtle variations of color. So it's um, not entirely, but largely monochromatic, mostly shades of greens and grays, and such slight variations. And here I think it's interesting, we've seen some examples of representational landscapes, the non-representational uses of color. And this image is really sort of in, in the middle. It's representational, it's, it's a landscape of course, but it has a really kind of abstract quality to it. A sense of the subtle shifts between one, one image and another, one form and another. We're going to leave you there. So hopefully you caught all of that vocabulary. If not, you know, scroll back through to whatever part you needed to grab and make sure that you feel really comfortable um, using and defining all the different terms that we've talked about today. Thank you, guys.